What's going on? This is Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy, and from the Miguel and Holly Morning Show on How 101.5 in Tampa Bay, Holly O'Connor is on the show. What's going on, Holly? Hey, I'm glad that you called me to be on the show. Thank you so much, Ryan. Of course. It was a weird thing. So when I first interviewed you five years ago, I wasn't really like ready to do interviews but I was doing it anyway. So like I was sort of waiting to like hone in on my craft to have you and Miguel on again. So then like I was laying at the pool like two weeks ago and I was like, I think it's time to have her on again. Yes. And that's great. You know what? It takes a good personality to understand that and to realize that. And I, I love that about you. So I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Anytime. I was thinking about it the other day, like, We've been friends since like 2014 when I met you at the morning show boot camp, but I never get to see you. But like when I'm driving to my second job in the morning, I'll tune on between you guys and Mike Kelta to see what's going on. And you guys have this thing. I don't know how you do it because most morning shows can't do it where it feels like I'm seeing you guys every day and it feels like I'm in the room because the way you communicate with the audience, it's like you're everyone's friend. Wow. You know what? Honestly, that's the probably the best compliment a morning show could get. So thank you very much, first of all. But yeah, we strive for that. We strive to basically have a table where we're sitting, but there's always space at the table for you. I mean, you're a listener, but we call our listeners, you know, family members, because that's what we really want to do. We want them to be family members. It's a discussion with us, but it's everybody really. So that's a great compliment. Thank you. Yeah. And what I find fascinating too, is there's so many shows I've only been in Tampa for six years, but you hear about all these shows that would try to come into Tampa and would just get run out of town, replacing big names. How did you guys come into Tampa doing your own thing? Like, for example, Miguel said that you guys since day one were not about radio awards. So like, what were some other things you guys did to put a name in this town since 2015? Okay. So first of all, what great question, because honestly, Tampa is sort of known for, for radio wars. I mean, you talk about Kelta and, you know, we both know Mike Kelta pretty well and, and understand his background and where he came from. And we all have heard about at least like the MJ and BJ days and those, you know, takedowns between him and Mason Dixon and everything was so like, I don't know, it's mean. It was a little mean because it was just about who could be the snarkiest and who could do it best. And we've never really liked that type of, of thing, mainly because we're not that type of people. <laughs> like, And I don't say that in a, in a judgy way. I mean, like, that's cool for the people that can pull it off. We can't pull that off because that's not who we are. So we don't know how to be mean and snarky and, and, and pull a gotcha on someone. So when we first came into... Um, the Cox Media Group building, our program director at the time, who was Dan Mason, sat us down and um, we sort of inherited a producer, uh, Nikki Nunez. Do you remember Nikki? Yes. Yeah. So we sort of inherited her and she had been working with the previous show and she had worked with other shows in that building. And so the three of us kind of sat down with our program director and we mapped out for the first two weeks of us in the building how we wanted the show to look what our mission statement was, you know, what our goals were and our, and this may be just kind of rehashing what Miguel said, but um, you know, our mission statement has always been to be a light for people that don't have one. Like we want to raise the energy. We want to raise the vibration in the city in which we work and live. And so we sort of grounded ourselves in positive vibes. And so we're like, we want you our goal as a morning show, we want you to feel something. We want you to feel happy or, you know, sad if that's the emotion that's being presented today or, you know, thoughtful or angry sometimes. I mean, not necessarily with each other, but like for different causes or whatnot. And so when we were saying all this, and we've talked to Nikki about this since, when we were saying all this and Nikki was just meeting us, she she started crying and she was like, I just don't know how you're going to pull this off. I don't even know what that looks like. I don't know what it means. I've never experienced it. And that was sort of a revelation of itself to us because it was, it was like telegraphing to us that this type of show, the type of show that we do 
hasn't been here. So we saw an opening, we saw a lane. Um, but the, the point is that we want to leave you feeling good and like you're part of something bigger than yourself. Um, and so we do that without like the, the getting one over on someone. And we wanted to bring that into Tampa because we felt that it really wasn't in existence yet. And it was difficult. Let me tell you what, because everyone expected snark like from the get go. So when we were on the air in those first months and even in the first years, honestly, we would get calls of <laughs> from people that were like ready to fight with us. You know, like we'd say something like crazy or off the wall and we'd get a caller and they'd be like, yeah, well, I don't think so. And we'd be like, oh, well, you know, tell me your point. And they'd be like, oh, okay, well, here's what I think. And then we'd be like, okay, well, I don't see it that way, but I could see how you see it that way. And that makes sense. And they would be sort of confused and, and be like, oh, okay, well, well, thanks for listening. I, I appreciate it. And we're like, yeah, let's have a good day. And so literally, like, it was like one by one, we had to prove to people that we were who we said we were. And um, we weren't here to, we weren't out to get you. We, we just really wanted to bring our own personalities to this show, to the city. And our personalities are just real humans. And, and that's how it all started. I remember one time, and um, rest in peace, Kane, but I remember one time, Miguel, I think he told me at the boot camp that like they really wanted you guys to go after FLZ when you first joined. And I think he told me one time you guys tried it on air and it just wasn't your thing to like just do that like mean-spirited radio. Because... I grew up listening to Opie and Anthony. Like I was a diehard Opie and Anthony fan, but Mm -hmm. it gets so tiring being a tough guy or being a tough woman. You know what I mean? Like being that like edginess on air that just, it's just, it makes you anxious. It makes you angry. It's just so tiring, you know? Right. Well, I mean, if you think about it and quick side tangent. So I've been really like diving into mental health and psychology over the last couple of years. And what I've, realize is that to be edgy and to be you know on the edge of your seat where you were talking you just said like you know it makes it's tiring it's exhausting think about the cortisol that's running through your body when you're always on the edge of your seat and having to expect someone to like pull the rug out from underneath you which i feel like um happens a lot or happened a lot maybe um and again i don't know i'm just i'm you know, I, I lived in Tampa for only a year before our current stint, so I can't speak to personal experience. But that level of always being worried for what's coming next, it actually produces like a fight or flight response in your body's nervous system. So, of course, it's exhausting. You're literally mentally exhausted waiting to see what sort of like battle you have to fight next. And like, who? I don't know. I, I personally, that's too much. I, got en- I have enough stuff going on in my life. I don't need to be also on the edge of my seat, ready for fight or flight while I'm working. Do you know? So yes, they did want us to go after FLZ. And as a matter of fact, I know that um, our station hot one one five did go after FLZ in its inception, which it was a different time, I guess. And, and that's kind of what you did, especially as the new kid in town, like you want to, rattle the cage and, and, you know, make people recognize that you're there. But as Hot 101.5 sort of matured and grew, we were like, okay, we don't, we don't need to do this. And it feels kind of yucky to us. So can we not? And there was a couple of things, um, again, you know, rest in peace, Kane. I, that was a mind blow situation when we, when we read that earlier this week, um, his, his passing. But um, yeah, they, there was a, a time in Hot's history and our history with Hot where they really wanted us to go after Kane and um, on air, you know, on social media. And it was scary for us because we were being told, you know, to do it because that's what you do in radio. You're just, if you know, you better get them before they get you first. So it was a tough internal battle for me, especially as the one who sort of presents like the trending news topics and Hollywood stuff. And now they're sort of combined. And, um, And so I remember going into that thinking, I'm about to be someone I'm not. And that didn't feel good. And, you know, talking about different things on air that sort of went against my character as a human didn't feel good either. And so after that, we decided, you know, I don't care what someone tells us to do. We just can't. We can't do 
this type of radio, you've hired the wrong people if, if this is what you're expecting. So I think we're going in the right area of talking more about mental health because obviously there's people like you that are getting really into it. Obviously with me, I'm a very anxious person and I fight it. But I also think that we do it when we want to. So like if it's Mental Health Month or National Mental Health Day, we're all about it. But I don't know Mm. what needs to be done for it to be done 24-7, you know? Like maybe you see it differently, but I just see it like we're not, we don't do it as often as we should, being open about it. Yeah, no, you're right. And I think it's going to take a huge overhaul. But what's kind of um, heartening to me, what's, what's hopeful to me is that I see it more often in little ways pop up because you're totally right. Like for the most part, like your average everyday citizen, you know, there's a month or there's a charity walk or, or, you know, something, there's a day that we call attention to, or God forbid, like someone famous, like very unfortunately commits suicide or something. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, mental health, we should really care more about it. And then we just go back to the same old things we've been doing. Well, what I've been doing in my personal life, it's just, it's not even that I'm actively like trying to do it. It's just that I have to, for me personally, I've been going to therapy for almost two years now for about a year and a half, maybe close to two years. And in that journey, I've learned so much personally that I'm excited to share it. And I don't, and I talked about this on the air today, actually. Um, You know, I said, I'm not trying to make it my mission and I'm not trying to, you know, be preachy in any way, but I get so (laughs) <laughs> like jazzed up like I get so excited about talking about it so the more people there are like me that have a platform and that are able to use it on the day-to-day I think the more it'll start to become a day-to-day topic like I think the pandemic has really brought that out for us because early on we knew that we were trying to look out for our physical health right like nobody wants to get actually sick with COVID-19 but as the month wore on and we realized oh this isn't stopping that's when you started to worry about how is this impacting people's mental health? And in the past year, people that never even had a a second thought about mental health suddenly found themselves like you anxious or depressed or any other number of mental health issues where they didn't know how to deal with it. And people looking for therapists or, you know, whatever they're looking for, I think has dramatically risen because people are like, I don't feel right in my mind and what can I do to help this? So I think just people like you, obviously, Hoppy, you have such a huge platform here with the podcast and on the air. People like me who do have a platform as well, even someone who maybe just does their job, either is working from home still, but they can share the message on social media with their friends. This is serious and calling attention to things, even when it might be uncomfortable. That's where I kind of view mental health as. So like you see a joke online and someone is categorized as like, oh, well, that's just so-and-so being crazy. It's just noticing those words. It's almost kind of like um, like the social justice movement that's been happening where we try to call attention and be anti-racist. You try to call attention and be proactive about mental health. You're like, okay, so what did you mean by that? Obviously, I'm not trying to, you know, like shame anybody, but let's let's pay attention to the words that we use and what they mean and what they can mean for people that are truly suffering with these types of disorders. So I feel like um, it just takes people like you, people like me who have a platform or people just, you know, out in the world living their lives and calling it out when they see it. Hey, this is something that, you know, we need to take kind of seriously. And it's uh, so I just, I feel like the more we talk about it on a day-to-day basis, the more it'll start to change. And I'm starting to see that. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to see that a little bit more on my social media. I think it began because we've had nothing to do. Now, Florida, COVID doesn't exist because we didn't really ever shut down. But like, I was talking to people that worked for the Woody show and they're just opening up in Los Angeles. Like, it's weird to think that because like Tampa never really shut down, that it's weird to think that Los Angeles is in the phase that we were in in May. I find that to be the weirdest thing ever. It's so weird. I have friends all over and I have a friend in where is she? somewhere in California, like Santa Monica or something. And she was telling me how crazy it is to see people in Florida just like outliving their lives and she's like yep 
still just doing the same thing we've been doing. And so that's where it, it's a weird thing between the states, where some of the states, you know, out west or up north, they're still dealing with this. And I can't, I, I honestly can't imagine what it must be like for them to have to see on social media people that get to live their life. And I think we've come to a point now in the pandemic where we're all just trying to live, right? Like we're trying to live our lives with precautions. And what we've learned over the past year is that it is possible to go and live your life with precautions. Like I'm not one that's going to like flagrantly disregard other people's health and safety, but I'm also not someone that's going to encourage you to stay in your home 24 seven, because again, not great for your mental health. And I'm trying to look out for both. Okay. So I was looking at my time hop and this time last year, the, uh, NCAA basketball tournament was canceled and I was going to make a lot of money doing a lot of promotion gigs for third leg Greg. And I remember I was fuming when that happened. Now looking a year later, I know why everything was shut down, obviously because of COVID. So my yeah. prediction, I thought it was like the swine flu. Like I was reading all those memes online where they were talking yeah. about previous flus and that it wasn't a big deal. So my mindset was very ignorant looking back, thinking it wasn't going to be a big deal. Now, when COVID was just beginning around this time last year, what did you, Miguel, Scotty, what did everybody at high, what was the energy about the beginning of the pandemic? We, um, interestingly, we did, a, we did our podcast today um, and we talked about that because we're, I'm, I personally have decided to call it the anniversary, the anniversary of the pandemic. Um, but we were like, yeah, how weird was it that as broadcasters, and you probably feel this too, as broadcasters, we sort of don't get giddy. Like, I don't want to make it seem like we're excited for catastrophes, but when there is some sort of emergency situation, I feel like that's who a lot of us broadcasters are at our core. We want to help people. We want to, you know, we're all considered essential workers for a reason. You know, our voices carry and we're giving information. We're also trying to keep people afloat. And our take was, what is this exactly? It seems serious, but is this going to be? And like, so what we tried to do a year ago was pass out information as we got it, but also try to keep calm, I think. And we were trying to be a little lighthearted with it. Like, I don't remember us, like we're, we're pretty, uh, we're, we try to keep people safe in the most part. So as, of, as opposed to you where you were like pissed, which I don't blame you, by the way, like a money loss is a money loss regardless of where it comes from. So I don't blame you for being pissed and I don't blame other people for losing out on money being pissed either. Um, but we were like, well, you know, let's just see. Let's just wait and see where this goes. In the meantime, take precautions. Don't hoard toilet paper. And like yeah. we tried to be kind of lighthearted about it, but we also were, were sort of tentative and like, this could be a big thing, but it's not yet. So let's just wait and see. And, you know, as the weeks went on, we kind of jumped into action and we were like, oh, shoot, like this is kind of a big deal. And maybe we should let, let's start taking this a little bit more seriously. And it was kind of early on that I put on my Facebook about um, taking precautions for COVID. And I got into like this Facebook fight with some random dude that I didn't know. And he was like, this is... Um, this is stupid and the COVID isn't real. And I was like, or, you know, we had, we are starting to get some research. Why don't we just play it rather safe and sorry, I guess at this point and just see how it goes. And as it went, we were like, Oh yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to need to start taking this seriously. And I said on our podcast today, it was actually March 13th, 2020. When I picked my daughter up from school, she was in first grade and it was a Friday, and she had spring break the following week. And when I picked her up, they sent me home with everything, like the books, her little school computer, like the laptop thing that she has. And they're like, we just don't know what to expect, so just here's everything. And I remember walking out of the school on that day with all her stuff, and I looked back and I was like, I have a bad feeling about this. I don't know if she's going to be back in this building because it, everything seemed like it happened so fast. Do you remember that? It just seemed like we started getting information out of everywhere. Well, what was weird for me was at first I just thought it was going to go away because I don't really watch any cable news. 
So I just, mm. it just makes me sad. It makes me angry, all sides of it. So I don't really watch it. So I wasn't really in the loop. But then since then, I have like the uh, cable news app. So I get all the news alerts, like knowing that uh, Jennifer Lopez is single now. That's, <laughs> I just saw that on Twitter, yes. But the thing is, I began to see that COVID was real when it kept pushing back when our office was going to get open. And then when, when, when we had to, when we had to have the official uh, badge to have in our car, remember when we had to print out that thing that said that we were yeah. allowed to go into work? That's kind of when it got a, it got real. And then when they kept pushing it back and Keith would be like, well, let's see if we can do it in another 30 days. Another 30 days would fly by. And that's kind of when it began to get real was when the numbers were going up. But then for my brain, it made no sense when we opened up in May. So the whole 2020 year when it came to how Florida dealt with COVID, I don't even know what we did, you know? I agree. It was it was very mind-boggling I, because you're hearing how, like death and destruction and meanwhile, in Florida, we're like, we got the beat. <laughs> so, like, we're good. And I was like, what are we doing? And so it was very strange. You were getting mixed information. And again, back to mental health, I'm sure tons of people were like, well, what the hell do I do? Like, what do I do with this information? Do we stay in? Do we go places? I don't know. So, yeah, it was very confusing. But I agree when we had to get our passes. And, uh, and print those out and carry them in the car, I was like, well, buckle up, because I'm sure this isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Now, I don't know how to word it, because like there was a lot of things that went on at work, but did you end up getting COVID in November? Because I think I got it around the same time you, didn't you get it? Yeah, I forgot about that. You got, I got it in it. November, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I, um, because of like, uh, rules about um hipaa we can't really talk about it but we got it from the I same talk about it. I, I have no problem talking okay. about it so you asked me questions okay so people. what was your experience like mine is pretty simple mine goes like this it was like and this is how i explain covid to anybody i didn't lose my taste i didn't lose my smell i picture it as like i went to a club i went to ebor city until five in the morning and I had 12 shots and then I slept for two hours and then I had to go to work. That hangover feeling after sleeping two hours, think about your worst hangover you've ever had. That's what I had for 14 days was that nausea and sweating. So I didn't lose oh, my taste. God. I didn't lose my smell, but that ringing hangover of when you first wake up, it was just that for two weeks. That was mine. Oh God. I, I, I don't envy you. I just pictured my worst hangover and it, it was a yeah. doozy and I would not ever want to relive that. So I'm so awful. sorry that you, that you went through that. Holy crap. Um, so mine, I think you probably had it like a couple, maybe a week or two before mine. And interestingly, someone else in our building, um, that works on the bone, yes. I'll say, I have a feeling he wouldn't care. Um, but what, what was interesting this is how mine kind of went down. So it was a Wednesday and I had sat in on my daughter's tumble class. Cause again, stuff is open um so it was in november it was a wednesday and i got a call from my pd and said hey someone in the building put you down on their um contact list because they've uh come down with covid and you were in an elevator with them it's very <laughs> much like a game of clue right yeah. you're like who was in the elevator that may have given you covid so i was like that was a wednesday night and i was like oh geez but see i had had that type of fear before where i had been like in the building with someone and I had to get tested and, and it was nothing. So I was like, whatever, I'll go tomorrow and I'll do my due diligence and I'll get tested. So, um, I went into work on Thursday and Miguel was in there and, um, he was like kind of sniffling around a little bit. And he's like, man, I, I think the allergies are starting up. You know, I may have a sinus infection. I was like, Oh, that sucks. And he's like, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I took a COVID test yesterday and I was like, Oh, the, do you think you got it from same person that was in the elevator with me? He's like, no, cause I haven't seen them. And I was like, Oh, well I'm getting a test today. And he's like, okay, I'll let you know what my test says. And I'm like, okay. I went Thursday. I took the test, the rapid test, the rapid test said negative. I was like, okay, whatever. I'm fine. It's cool. So I send my daughter to school Friday. I go to work. Um, oh no, what was it? So on Thursday, on my rapid test was negative. Miguel calls me Thursday night and he was like, I have COVID. And I was like, well, I don't know if I can swear on your podcast. Can I swear you on your can, podcast? Yeah. Yeah. 
I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> because if Miguel has it, how do I not? So by then, I'm start, obviously starting to freak out, even though my rapid test was negative. But since it was negative, I'm like, well, let me send my daughter to school Friday. I don't know what's going on. But, of course, our boss was like, well, you guys can't come in. Miguel has it. You've got to stay home whether or not you have it. So Friday, I went and got tested. And this time, I did the rapid and the PCR test. So by that point, I was, like, starting to feel a little stuffy. But yeah. I was like, it, it's not COVID. I don't know if you realize this, but there was this thing where it's, like, denial, where you're like, I can't. I can't have it. I can't have COVID. So I was in that sort of COVID denial and um, my rapid test again came back negative. So I'm like, I don't have it. Except for Friday night, I got sick. Like that's when it sort of all hit me like bricks. I started to get a fever. I started to just not feel well. Like it felt like the flu, very much like the flu to me. And um, so I was like still thinking, but that rapid test said negative. So I can't have COVID. But by Saturday morning, I woke up and I knew that I was sick. So, I mean, I tried to go to this walk-in clinic. They said, just wait on the PCR test. I got the PCR test results back that Saturday afternoon. And absolutely, I had COVID. And so I tried to tell as many people as I could. I was like, do not trust the rapid testing. I had two negatives, but the PCR test came back positive. And it turns out Miguel had been at a party um, like the previous weekend, like a, like a, Everybody knew each other. It was only like, I think, eight people, and they were being very safe. But it was one of those house parties, and he picked up COVID there, and then um, I got it from him like that same day. I think he must have come in Monday with it. And I ended up um, feeling mainly like the flu. TMI, I had diarrhea. That was my big thing. I had a completely stuffed up nose. It felt like I, my head was just full. So I was like doing my nose spray twice a day. And eventually I did lose my taste and smell, which was so weird. I was eating stuff and I'm like, I could, I think this is salty, but I can't taste it. Or I think this might be sweet, but I can't taste it. It was the super weirdest thing. And that whole experience was about maybe about 10 days. And then I started finally feeling better. But did you, I'm curious, did you have those like lingering symptoms that they say can go for a few weeks or months? I think I have lingering like nausea. Like I get worn out easier around like 3 or 4 p.m. in the afternoon. I have to like drink a cup of coffee or something to wake up. And like I never had that prior. And even this afternoon, I like took a nap and I got up at 8 and it's not that, I, I don't know. It's like. I just don't feel the same after it. Like it feels like, okay. So like if I have to swim laps to like work out or whatever, it feels like I'm putting in more effort than it was pre COVID. So I can kind of notice little things. That totally makes sense. I would say for about <clears throat> probably two to three months after I had that, you know, initial blast of COVID, I would get that exhaustion and it would hit me around like five or six o'clock at yeah. night. And I would be either driving and I would be like, oh my God, I just got so tired. Me or I, I would be just like in like at CVS grabbing a prescription or something for my mom. And I would be like, I could fall asleep against this wall. Like I could literally fall against this wall and go to sleep right now. And that happened almost daily. And then it got kind of spaced out, but it probably lasted for about three months, that exhaustion and the brain fog where my mind oh, yeah. just would not work as quick as it normally does. Now, so I get up, at three in the morning on Saturday and then like 6 a.m. on Sunday. So I don't do the like morning show every single week, but I have noticed too. I don't know if you've noticed this because you do Monday through Friday prime time getting up in the morning. Isn't it a little bit harder to get up too? Like I feel like the old me, the alarm would annoy me and I'm like, fine, I'm up. But now it like, it feels like it's taking more effort and I find myself snoozing a little more and just getting to work on time when I didn't do that. And I think that's probably a lingering thing from the COVID is like, it feels like it's taking more effort to wake up when, you know, it didn't prior. Yeah. yeah, I would say so too. Like when that alarm hits, I'm always just like, can I get 10 to 15 more minutes? Yeah. Because it does, it feels just very exhausting. I would totally agree with you. So 
Before I let you go, this is what I ask every person recently that I've had on, and uh, Miguel's answer was fascinating, so I want to hear if you guys have the same mindset. When it's all said and done, what do you want your legacy to be in radio? Hmm, that's a tough tough one, and also a really good one. So, my legacy in radio, I want people to know that I am authentic and that I have helped others. That's, that's what I would like my legacy to be. And I mean, I don't know, I don't know what that looks like exactly. I mean, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't have like a shaped out vision and I'm not not sure if he did or not, but I would say I would want my legacy to be that I've actively helped people. You know, I, I try to, help and um and give an example by leading like i try to um practice what i preach and i try to learn as much as i can and when someone tells me that you know i hurt them from something i said i actively take that in try to learn from it and try to be better and so i i'm honestly always trying to be a better version of me and i hope that that comes out on the air and that my fondest wish would be that I'm helping other people become the greatest version of themselves by believing in themselves because everybody has it. In, and I, maybe that sounds cheesy, but you know what? I don't care. Like I really just, my fondest wish would be that other people can continue to grow and be the highest ideals of themselves. And maybe it's something that I said that sparked that, or maybe it's they heard me on a bad day being very real and very human. And they realized that that's okay. And that, the human experience, we're all like the same. We have the same heart that beats and we we have a lot more in common than we have differences. And I would hope that by hearing me on the radio <clears throat> and, and me doing this career and giving my heart and soul into this career is that it genuinely helps other people become their best selves. That's that, my goal. That answer is pretty close to what Miguel said, but his was about that uh, – Pretty much it was anti-radio wars and that when he came into Tampa that you guys didn't need to do that and that it was a show that listeners could turn to. So it's pretty much the same answer. (laughs) Well, that makes sense. (laughs) That makes sense. We are very similar on a lot of things. And I think radio-wise, we have always had the same goals. I mean, we are different people and we do have a lot of differences. But when it comes to radio, I, I call him my radio soulmate. I think because of, I mean, that is right there. We have the same goal and we, we always aim for the same uh, dynamic. And, and so it's really good. It's, we both lucked out, I think, finding each other and being able to build that dream together. And so I think that's the benefit that our listeners get by having a show that can fulfill that need. So now for people that haven't heard your show, how can they check it out and why should they tune in? Okay. You should tune in because we are just a couple of real people. And when I say couple, I mean actually three because we just brought on our producer full time, which is amazing. Doesn't happen hardly ever in radio anymore. Um, so it's myself, Miguel, Scotty the Body. And um, we do our show live Monday through Friday on Hot 101.5 on the radio, 6 till 10. Um, and we do a lot of live streaming. So if you're on Facebook, you can catch our live streams at least one or two times every single show. We'll, we'll hop online and do a live. Um, we're on all social media, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. We're on all of them. Um, so we're able, we're very easily reachable. And we do a podcast called Miguel and Holly Uncensored. And that's truly uncensored. And we get very real and very personal and very raw. And um and we have the app. You can also find us on the Hot 101.5 app. And the Miguel and Holly Uncensored podcast is on anywhere you listen to podcasts. Well, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show. And um, maybe if there's ever like, I don't know if there is one. So I'll ask you, is there like a mental health club at Cox Media Group? Because I think that would be a fascinating thing to have. Wow. I don't think so. But you put a little seed in my head, Ryan Hoppy. Let me think on that. We should do that because um, it's so relieving to hear that other people go through it. Because, like, I'll just have these thoughts in my head, like, nothing bad, but just, like, 
anxious when I'm driving or whatever. But to hear that other people go through it, it makes me, it makes it easier for me to turn it off, you know? Cause like I used to think like a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, especially after my breakup, like I just thought I was the only one that was going through it. But to hear that like my, my friends also go through it, it makes it easier for me to deal with. Absolutely. And by the way, honestly, and like just off the cuff, off the record, like you can always reach out to me on the DMs or my messages or whatever. Always feel free to reach out. And I tell people that too. You can find me personally, um, Radio Holly on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. You can always slide up on the DMs in Radio Holly and um, I can try to help you out there. I have, I've recently, as recently as this week, finally figured out what to tell people who need help that either don't have insurance to cover therapy or can't afford therapy, period. So I have some tips if you want to um, ask me any of those questions on, on, you know, just after this. And also, um, no, you're not alone. We're all going through something, some of us more than others. And the more you reach out, the more help you're going to find. Well, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show. It's been awesome seeing you guys grow as a show here in town because I basically moved here like two months after you guys joined. So keep up the yeah. good work. And um, it's been a lot of you fun too. having you I'm on the so show. Proud of you. I'm so proud of you for all of that you've done. I really am. So congratulations, especially on all your success. And I will see you around. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right. Bye. And that was Holly O'Connor from the Miguel and Holly Morning Show on How 1015 as she called into Hoppy Hour. Now, I produce all the weekend shows on 1025 The Bone. So if you guys want to check it out, the massive fan base of Miguel and Holly that I am talking to right now, I would greatly appreciate it. And I also record this podcast, but I do a celebrity news rant show as well the same podcast so go to every single major platform that has a podcast spotify tune in spreaker apple music amazon music and search up happy radio